Okay, we are going to talk uh, today about the excretory system and osmo or water regulation. Uh, just a quick review that you, all of the systems of you or any animal operate in a liquid environment. And so the organism has to maintain narrow limits. Okay, remember that's the concept of homeostasis. maintain internal concentrations within narrow limits. Uh, so if you think about this, if you uh, live in fresh water, you have to have certain adaptations. If you live in the water, if you live in salt water, or this says desert, but actually on land, anytime you're on land, you face a desiccating, that means to lose water environment. So there have to be different adaptations for both of those. And we're going to talk about certain adaptations of that. So water regulation regulates solute concentrations. So the concentrations of things like potassium and sodium, chlorine, and other necessary nutrient, other necessary uh, things, and balances the gain and loss of water. Okay, and then of course to get rid of anything we don't need, we call it excretion. Okay, maybe we don't need as much water, so we excrete it. We, I just always say we, organisms. So osmoregulation is based largely on controlled movement of solutes between internal fluids and the external environment. The key here is controlled movement. It's the controlled movement we're going to talk about. So if you think about a saltwater animal, Okay, if you're a saltwater invertebrate, you're an osmoconformer. That means the your internal equals external. Okay, that we talked about that with thermoconform. You can be a temperature conformer if you're ectothermic. Okay, so their internal salt environment is the same as the external. But most vertebrates have to regulate, most fish have to regulate the amount of water they have. And I have a couple slides here to show you that. Here's a marine fish, saltwater fish. Problem for a saltwater fish is that their internal environment is hypertonic to their, I'm sorry, hypotonic to their outward environment. So they constantly have to be getting rid of salt. They can excrete it from their gills. Okay, they're constantly trying to get rid of salt so that it's so they want to pump salt out, okay, to keep water in. They live in an environment that will dehydrate them. So what they do is they produce very little urine, scanty, very little urine, okay. They excrete salt ions here. They excrete salt ions here, okay. They have a little bit of water loss, or they have quite a bit of water loss through their body surface, so they don't have to urinate very much. By contrast, a freshwater fish doesn't have the problem. In fact, they need to get salt, and so they get it through their gills. Kind of the opposite. They produce large amounts of urine. Produce large amounts of urine. Why? Because they're in a they uh, they're in a situation where they will gain too much water. Their cells will gain too much water, so they have to constantly get rid of it. And then there's a pretty cool thing called anhydrobiosis, where some invertebrates live in temporary ponds. And so they can survive. Sorry, that didn't show up. They can dehydrate. And then when water shows up again, they rehydrate. Pretty cool concept, and then they're just fine. It's called a tardigrade. It looks pretty cool, doesn't it? I think it is. I think those things are awesome. Land animals, we manage our water by uh, drinking and eating and using what's called metabolic water. And here's a couple examples. A kangaroo rat hardly ever has to drink water. It lives in the desert. But where it gets its water is it eats food, and so it gets some water that way. And then in the process of breaking down its food through cellular respiration, remember, one of the byproducts is water. 
that's where it gets most of its water. It's called derived from metabolism by breaking by doing cellular respiration. Notice they have uh, they lose a lot of water through evaporation because of where they live. A little bit in their solid waste and some in their urine. Look at the difference from a human. We have to take in a lot of liquid. We get relatively small amount from metabolism. We have to take in a lot from our food. But of course then we produce a lot more urine per uh, as water loss and we lose a lot through evaporation. Notice this is a surface area to volume thing again, structure and function. Because they're so small, they have a larger surface area compared to the volume, a lot more evaporation. So they urinate less. It's a balance. So for example, a desert animal like a camel, this experiment was done, and this is just interesting. They clipped the fur in one group. And they uh, left the control group with unclipped fur. And look at the difference in amount of water that they lost. Uh, one more liter per 100 kilograms of body mass with fur. You would think that the fur would make them hot, but it actually traps water in. So the idea of transport epithelia then. Transport epithelia are specialized cells that regulate the movement of solutes. Again, sodium, chlorine, potassium, and others. Okay, things that are dissolved in water. All trans transport epithelia are arranged in tubular networks, and we're going to look at a few of those. Okay, there's tubular networks that these transport epithelia are arranged in. So you have a tube with cells along it, that can move things through them. Here's a marine bird that has salt glands in its head to help excrete salt. Here's an example inside of a mammal or any kind of other organism where you have a tube lined with these epithelial cells that transport things into the blood and out of the blood. Okay, and generally you get this arrangement of movement of particles like salt and water right next to it with a blood vessel right next to it associated with it so you can get this diffusion and osmosis going on. So, uh, what animals produce are nitrogenous wastes. Okay? What are called nitrogenous breakdown products of proteins and nucleic acids. Remember, carbohydrates, CHO, fats, CHO, proteins and nucleic acids have nitrogen. And that's a problem because we need some nitrogen, but we also, some of this breakdown products are toxic. Some of the breakdown products are toxic, and so animals have to be able to get rid of that. There are three major kinds of breakdown products. So proteins are broken down to amino acids, the amino group is stripped off, and we have to get rid of that. Most aquatic animals produce ammonia. Mammals, most amphibian sharks produce something called urea, and then birds and stuff and reptiles and insects produce uric acid. This comes out as a paste. Okay, you've seen uric acid from a bird this white pasty uh, stuff is uric acid. Now you can see, so urea is mammals like humans, aquatic animals produce ammonia. And then I'm going to kind of skip the next slide, which goes through that in a little more detail. The next couple slides. Okay. Oh, just a brief thing about our liver. What our liver does is takes ammonia and converts it to urea. One of the problems with liver failure is the fact that now we get a buildup of ammonia in our cells, which kills cells. Toxic. Okay? Urea is a little bit better. Then the circulatory system carries urea to the kidneys, where it's excreted. And then, of course, uric acid, which I've already mentioned. 
So there are uh, a few different kinds of excretory systems I'm going to just briefly talk about so you recognize the terms. Okay, but again, they regulate the movement of solutes between internal and external environment. There's four key characteristics of an excretory system. You have to be able to filter body fluids. You have to take back what you want, reabsorb. You have to be able to secrete things that you don't want back into what's called the filtrate, which I'm just going to put is going to end up being urine. And then you have to be able to get rid of the urine, the actual excretion. So here's the concept. Blood, in the case of animals, of mammals and stuff, and other kinds of body fluids, come into a filtering system. It's squeezed like a sponge. So the pressure, like a sponge, all kinds of stuff comes out. Some of that stuff you need. Let's say H2O. You need that water. That has to be reabsorbed back into the blood. Some things that end up going out with the water have to be put back into the urine. That's called secretion. And then finally, when you get done with the tube, you have excretion. And now this blood is going to recirculate. So, just a few kinds of excretory systems. Uh, something called a proto-prenephridium. Dead-end tubes, no internal openings. Okay, and the example of that is in an organism called a planarian. Planarians have what's called a flame bulb system where uh, fluid filters into here and then leaves. Metanephridia would be in an earthworm. Each segment of an earthworm has, you see this tube surrounded by blood vessels, and then a little bitty... Uh, this is transport epithelia where stuff excretes into that and will be excreted by the worm out of a hole in its body surface. Okay, and they use fancy words like nephrostome. The prefix or the root nephro refers you to kidney or excretion. That's an important idea that will help you recognize those words. Insects have things called malpighian tubules. Just recognize the term in insects. Okay, and again, same idea. They have these kind of tubules that go around their gut as stuff passes through them. Salt, water, and nitrogen waste go from, remember, they have an open circulatory system. So things they don't need to fuse in there and they don't urinate, they only have one opening their rectum and anus openings, they get rid of everything that way. Vertebrate kidneys are a little more complicated. Okay, and there's a lot of writing here. It's kind of an overview. Uh, you have kidneys. You have urine exits each kidney through a duct called the ureter. And the ureters train into a bladder which is excreted to the outside. I highly recommend looking up some animations online of how the human uh, excretory system works. Here's an overview. Blood comes in the renal artery and vein, filtered in the kidney, urine goes out, and it's filtered in this thing called a nephron, which we're going to spend a little bit of time with right now. Okay. Inside of each kidney are millions of nephrons. Nephrons work in the same principle we just talked about. Blood is filtered. This little ball just happens to be called the glomerulus if you're counting. What, this ha what happens is it's kind of like taking your room and cleaning it by throwing everything out into the hall. This is the hall. So everything comes out of the blood except for a little bit of water and blood cells. Some proteins and other things. This stuff out here on the outside represents the bloodstream. So 
as the filtrate passes out of the glomerulus, it passes down this thing called a loop of Henle. Loop of Henle. As it passes down the loop of Henle, water is put back into the blood. It's reabsorbed back into the blood. And you see this loop of Henle goes down, 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 down. And see, it's a long loop. Okay? Concentration of water runs opposite. It's counter current exchange system. Now, as you get down here, we've lost a lot of the water. Now, salt can be taken out of the urine. Going back up the loop of Henle. And then, as we get to the end of the tube, we can excrete a little more water, some bicarbonate ion. We put into the urine extra potassium and extra hydrogen ions and then that ends up in a longer tube called a collecting duct which it's on its way out okay all those collecting ducts drain into here this part of the kidney called the renal pelvis because it looks like one this tube is going to the bladder the bladder is going to the outside okay millions of nephrons in your kidney performing that function Okay, in mammals, the kidney produces concentrated urine. Concentrated urine. So you keep water. And again, here's another view of the same idea, showing water concentrations, I'm sorry, solute concentrations in the kidney as water is taken out. So uh, there's some writing here about that. And it's not really that important. All right, so how is it regulated? And maybe you've noticed that some days you urinate more than others. Maybe you've noticed that after you drink some liquid, you have to urinate. How does your body, quote, know? How do you know you have to get rid of water? Well, we're going to talk about hormones in the next chapter. But there's an organ in your brain called the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus has receptors that recognize the level of water. When osmoreceptor cells in the hypothalamus detect an increase in the osmolarity of the blood, in other words, there's more blood in your urine. Sorry, I said that wrong. When there's more water in your urine, So, less water equals the release of something called antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland. Antidiuretic hormone increases the permeability of the loop of Henle and tubules to water. In other words, it's easier for water to go back into the blood. That raises the amount of water in the blood, which is homeostasis. If you don't need it, if you have plenty of water in your blood, ADH is not released. Keeping water in your urine. Okay, maybe you've heard that alcohol and coffee are diu, I'm sorry, I spelled that wrong, diuretics. Okay, diuretics are things that keep water in your urine. They decrease the permeability of the loop and the collecting duct. So they keep water in your urine. So even though you might need water, you can get dehydrated by alcohol, coffee, and other diuretics. Antidiuretic hormone makes water go back into your blood. So decreases the amount of water that you produce from your kidneys. There's another uh, system called the RAAS system, renin aldosterone angiotensin system this is in response to low blood volume or low blood pressure 
it produces a hormone called renin from your kidneys. Renin leads to angiotensin, angiotensinogen to angiotensin, which makes arterioles constrict. So reducing the, value, the size of the blood vessel, which would increase B blood pressure. Also makes the adrenal gland produce aldosterone, which increases the amount of water absorption to increase blood pressure and blood volume. So uh, one adaptation would be something like a kangaroo rat, which we like using as our example. Its kidneys, because they live in the desert and they want to conserve water, they want to put water back in their blood, its kidneys have this super long loop of Henle. Longer the loop, the more water back into the blood. Something like a beaver that lives in a very wet environment and gets plenty of water has a very short loop, of, would have a shorter loop of Henley. Because they don't need to get as much water back into their blood. That is a discussion of the excretory system.